Hi, I'm Tracy Tegahama Espinosa, and this is a video on feedback and its role in learning. What is actually happening in the brain when we receive positive and good and strong and direct feedback? The core concept is that we know that feedback about learning processes influences learning outcomes. So feedback itself can be a source of learning. The type, frequency, and use of feedback can influence learning outcomes. However, this varies by individual preferences. So from the get-go, it's really important to share a definition. And I really am partial to the ideas that uh, Wiggins and McTighe had about feedback serving as a continual improvement approach. We know what our objective is. We know how we're going to measure it. And basically, the role of feedback is to bridge that gap. We know where we want to be. We know where we are now. Gap analysis. What do we need to get better at in order to, to reach those objectives? Feedback, however, is not just a unidirectional process of what a teacher does to a student. We know that to know ourselves better, we can either reflect internally and think about our own processes, or we can get feedback from the outside world. And both of these are very important in shaping who we become as learners. So there's a really key relationship here, not only in knowing ourselves, but this general development of metacognitive awareness, metacognitive skills, we know that formative evaluation and feedback, they go hand in hand. When we receive the right kind of feedback, that helps nurture our emerging metacognitive skills. And this occurs in the classroom when a teacher habitually asks students the same kinds of questions over and over again. Well, do you have all the materials we need to get started? Or what do you already know about this information? Helping them develop this kind of an internal dialogue to double check that they have everything ready, that they have really prepared themselves for the new learning that's about to come. So there's this very explicit relationship between the quality of the feedback that we give as teachers and those emerging metacognitive skills that the kids are working on. When we offer feedback, especially if it's done in a questioning form, right, this helps those students develop their own self-verbalization, this, this internal dialogue that they have as they face new problems in the future. So feedback, if it's done right, without any kind of harmful elements attached, it's basically trying to help them develop this internal dialogue so that they can have stronger metacognitive skills in the end. Feedback from others is really this kind of a checks and balances of our own thought processes. Well, this is where I think I'm at, oof, but other people saw it the other way. Great, I learn more about myself when I learn about the other. When I know what you think of me, I become better in self-assessing where I'm at with new learning. This is important because it's really innate in human beings. Nobody wants to fail. Nobody refuses learning. In fact, learning is the most natural thing that your brain does, right? So it's natural to want to become better. And hearing what other people think or how they assess our performance helps us then think, okay, what would I do different the next time? How could I improve upon that? So feedback helps us compare ourselves and our actions with the expectations that are shared within the classroom setting. So it's interesting now, who should give feedback? And in many schools now, they incorporate what's called a 360 evaluation. The students are evaluated by the teacher, but the teacher's evaluated by the parents, but the parents also give feedback to the students, and the students give feedback to the administration. 360, everybody gives information to everybody else with the sole purpose of improving the system. But what's really important to take into consideration is that we value information, we value comments from the people we respect. So when we get feedback from significant people in our lives, from from people who we think are caring about us, who are there for our own protection, like parents, for example. That does shape our self-efficacy and our self-concept. And all of this, if it works out right, leads to a wonderful culture of evaluation. We know that institutions, classrooms, individual teachers, individual people who are open to evaluation learn faster. Those are those strong learning environments where there's ongoing, continual feedback that helps the system improve on a continual basis. And this is done because each of the actors continually improves as well. You know, there are different types of feedback tools. People can get written feedback, they can get oral feedback. We know that much of the reception of feedback, however, hinges on good communication and on those personal interactions. So I, I want to clarify a little bit on this terminology. We talk a lot about feedback. In other contexts, people talk about formative evaluation, the idea that we give information to continually improve an individual. So formative evaluation and feedback are often interchanged. 
And one of the reasons that feedback as a term has become so popular is because the word evaluation strikes fear into a lot of people. But feedback doesn't create the same level of angst. And I may have mentioned on other occasions this whole concept of feedback and the way that teachers interact with students. We oftentimes sort of silo this off in our head as a moment. Okay, this is the time I'm going to give feedback. When the truth of the matter is, is that we are always giving feedback and we're also always getting feedback. We have to be receptive to that though. There was a wonderful article by Giordano who talked about when we don't know that when we're teaching and he measured, you know, these small, short, uh, seconds long conversations that we have with students and we're not even aware that those are teaching moments but that level of feedback that interaction can change an individual for better or for worse students interpret just about every interaction we have as a type of feedback and we as teachers have to understand that that amazing power but also that responsibility that comes with understanding that students are looking to us to guide their thinking processes by the way that we offer feedback the best type of feedback quality is uh, feedback that is regular, it's formative, it searches for mastery goals, it's sincere, and that it's embedded in part of the interaction, the natural processes that we have with students. We know that students who feel these characteristics, that they receive regular formative feedback that's working towards mastery goals, are more intrinsically motivated to complete work. So in summary, this means that you know offering Far more formative feedback than just emphasis on those summative goals is really beneficial to learning environments. And hopefully we all as teachers are more welcoming and have a bigger and more accepting culture of evaluation. If we all thought evaluation is a teaching tool, it should just be one more way to help us get to those learning goals with students, then we might strip away that negative connotation that evaluation often has. So to contrast a bit, we talked a little bit how feedback is very similar to formative evaluation. Then there's also these contrast of formative versus summative evaluation. It is very common in many systems around the world, many institutions, that there's a heavy weight on summative assessment, which are things like state assessments or scores or SAT type of testing. As compared with, you know, writing an exit ticket or checking in with students as a natural part of the instructional process. It is a pity when there's way too much emphasis on a summative assessment that there's real learning opportunities that are missed by doing that. Sometimes the best learning moments are just in the time when a student has received an evaluation score and in that moment there's this aha, I know what I didn't do, now I can do it better. But then if we're doing only summative evaluation, we just sort of drop that and move on to the next topic. Whereas if we were doing formative assessment, take that as a great learning moment and progress towards that student's own personal development. Dylan William has been uh, wonderful in writing books related to formative embedded assessment, which actually seeks mastery. This is probably the ultimate when it comes down to evaluation criteria in education. He makes it clear that when we aim towards formative assessment, when we give feedback and we're trying to seek mastery learning goals, it's clear that those students outperform students who are just after a summative or performance assessment. So another link here is this formative assessment going towards mastery learning. Before we used to consider this as a kind of black box of teaching, right? And especially so when we say that, you know, formative assessment can have a powerful impact on student motivation and achievement. But the precise mechanisms of this were not known for so long. Now that we have a little bit more insight into the brain, it's really apparent why formative assessment is, is so much more beneficial than just summative assessment. So this black box of understanding how feedback is taken in by the brain is kind of interesting and we're beginning to disentangle it. The bottom line is, is your brain actually evaluating the negative or is it valuing the positive? It almost depends on your mindset. So different people are going to react to different types of feedback in different ways. If you're perceiving that the feedback that's being given is something beneficial to you, then it's like, bring it on, wonderful, great, I'm learning. And this has to do with a different kind of a mindset, which are related to distinct neural mechanisms. I love being evaluated because I think anybody who's evaluating me is doing it to help me be better, not to hurt me. But if you perceive a threat there, then there's this basic turnoff and you are not going to be able to focus and you're really not going to take a lot of information in. So the way that feedback is delivered, the tone of voice, the way that the moment, the timing, 
of when it's given makes a very big difference. Another way that we could look at this is considering Carol Dweck's work on mindsets, on people who have fixed mindsets, who don't think that they can change, who believe that they have inherited a way of being, versus people with growth mindsets. The way that they perceive feedback mechanisms is very distinct, and the way that they process them is also very distinct. So it comes back down to this that if we wanted to really understand what's actually happening in the neural mechanisms of the brain, it really refocuses right back into psychology, what's happening in the mind. The potentials for changes in the brain are very much grounded in the way our mind perceives the information. Is this a threat or is this something that's beneficial to me? Is this something I have control over and can change? Or is it something that is out of my control? I don't have any way to change my fixed mindset because I was born that way. Uh, Courtney Cedar has a great webpage related to uh, this idea of feedback and how to give and receive feedback within the workplace. And some of the recommendations can definitely apply to our classrooms. She suggests that the feedback provider has to be credible in the eyes of the feedback recipient, that the provider is somebody who is trusted. They're not doing this out of malice, right? that the feedback is conveyed with good intentions and that the timing is precise. And then it's given in an interactive manner. It's almost as if uh, I'm gonna give you some feedback, but I'd like you to give me some as well. That the message is clear, that there is definite next steps that are in place and that the feedback is considered helpful by the recipient. Again, all of this is very much dependent on the individual. She also suggests that there are actually some wrong reasons to give feedback. You know, I'm gonna give them a piece of my mind, right? And then there's other reasons that we give feedback. If we're committed or concerned about somebody and that we want to genuinely help the improvement or we want to mentor that individual or support or enhance their learning, right? Those are the right reasons to, to give feedback. And getting more, you know, brass tacks, getting down to the actual application of this within school context, formative embedded assessment means that evaluation and the activity are actually one and the same thing. So for example, if you have a debate or problem-based learning or things like that, actually the process of the activity itself is what is actually evaluated. And so this is seen to be some of the best use of time, the best ways to use feedback within classroom settings. We want to have evidence of what we are actually producing and that we have teachers who are flexible enough to adjust to the needs of each of these learners. We have different types of strategies. There's clarifying strategies. There are ways of engineering good classroom discussions. There's direct feedback, which moves learning forward. There is turning over the responsibility of the work. The person who does the work is the person who does the learning over to the student themselves. And that eventually students actually become resources for each other. They see themselves in that role, that they are there to help the group grow, right? And there are different types of activities, specific activities that you can do in class to enhance each of these different strategies. Once again, just to remind us that the ultimate goal, I would hope, in education is towards mastery goals. Unfortunately, our school systems have been very, very focused on performance goals. That detracts and actually changes the role of feedback in our classrooms. It's important to also divide this up when we talk about grading processes. We know that we have to diagnose. There's a pre-assessment. We have to know where the baseline is. Where did the kid begin from? And then during the instruction, we have to be giving that formative feedback. And then when things are done, we can give a summative assessment. There's a time and a place for each of these different steps, but it's highly recommended that they all be taken into consideration because if there is no baseline, if we don't know where the students started from, it's very hard to be able to then value how much they've grown with their learning. And this gets to Guski's uh, big idea related to product, process, and progress goals. Do we have these criteria really clear in our head? Are we just after the product? That would be the performance-based learning. Or should our feedback also include an evaluation of processes and the progress that student has made? As mentioned earlier, some of the best teaching moments happen right alongside evaluation. When a student gets back that test or that paper or the project and they realize, ah, now I know what I should have done, that's a key moment, right? And uh, John Hattie's evaluation of trying to figure out what really influences student learning, he talked about this point for sort of being what a generally good teacher would do. Well, anything above point four, so for example, point five, would be even more beneficial to general student learning. And one of those things has to do with second and third chances to learn from your mistakes. Okay, let's try this. Instead of having a process by which you get a grade on this particular test or this particular paper, let's do this in stages. You have the opportunity to learn from your mistakes. Okay, you won't get full points because you didn't do it right the first time, but 
you will get, uh, you'll have something taken off because it's being regraded, but you'll have the opportunity to improve. My, I used to always tell my kids they could either study before the test or after the test, but they're going to get a perfect score at some point, right? So the do-over possibility is something huge in filling in learning gaps. It's very important to take into consideration this big idea of human variability that we always uh, discuss a lot in our class, but different people need different things, and that includes different types of feedback at different moments. Some people love public feedback. Other people hate the level of ability as shared with the group. So teachers really have to keep their finger on the pulse of what each individual kid needs to be able to succeed in that class. Just to make one last big leap here, feedback and motivation are very closely tied. And again, this comes back uh, to this idea, Guski's idea of product process and progress. If we're only going to be mentioning you know, how good the final product was, we might not motivate kids as much as saying, you know, I know this isn't the grade you wanted, the product, right? This isn't the grade you wanted, but I can see you've really put a lot of time and energy into this and that you've really gathered the right information. I'm sure you're going to be able to do this in the end. Acknowledging the processes that they've done and the progress that they've made can be hugely motivating to an individual student. So a penultimate point here is about who gets and who gives feedback. Right now, most of you have presumed that what we're talking about is how teachers interact with students. One of the things that I think that we need to understand and maybe embrace, um, a suggestion that was made by John Hattie, is that that's kind of backwards. Um, we should always be evaluating ourselves. Anytime a student is evaluated, that's actually an evaluation of ourselves. So how should teachers get feedback? I'd like to share a video by Bill Gates. It's a teeny bit longer than we normally have, but it's really well worth the time. So what Bill Gates did not mention there is that this idea of filming yourself is really a highly acclaimed and well-researched methodology for teacher improvement. It's called micro-teaching. It was started in Stanford way back in the 70s. And I'd like you to think about that. You know, getting feedback about how we do better is not only for us to give to students, but it's how we learn to improve our own practice as well. So final slide here is just to understand how this feedback loop, the formative assessment, really works within instructional processes. We start at a space where we're looking at learning progressions, and then there's formal and informal collaboration amongst the students. We've established the clear learning goals. There's clear success criteria for the students. And then there's instruction on the part of the teacher or on the group activity that's, that's evolved. Then we elicit quality diagnostic evidence on students' current thinking. Where are they now with this information? Where do we want them to be? That is feedback to ourselves to understand what is this gap that we need to be filling with instruction, right? We interpret that diagnostic evidence of where students are at and then realize, well, they already know that, so then we can just move on and then we start with a new goal. However, if they have a gap in their understanding and what they need to do, then we have to clarify that learning gap. We have to give feedback about what they need to do to be able to reach that objective that we've established. And then we use evidence that's been provided by that interaction, by that teaching intervention to improve our work. We can either allow then for students to then build off of their own knowledge or we can scaffold that through ongoing instruction that we give them and the loop continues. So the big idea here is to use feedback as an integral part of this instructional process and something that we can use to continually build students' thinking processes. So great, I'll stop here. Looking forward to all of your questions about feedback when we get together. Thanks a lot.